Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our virtual gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. We're the statewide membership-based historic preservation organization. My name is Beverly Thomas and on behalf of the Preservation Alliance, I'm pleased to welcome you to New England Porches, History and Preservation with Thomas Visser. We are now in our second month of Old House and Barn Expo on the road, our COVID safe replacement for our postponed 2020 Expo. We'll be offering these virtual sessions throughout the year and hope to include some in-person events in the fall. We love getting you and other old house and barn enthusiasts together to share practical information from highly qualified presenters, making connections and offering you a dose of energy and inspiration too. A few housekeeping points I'd like to mention before we get started. We will be recording the session today. So please remain muted throughout the program. Um, just to help us keep the background noise down. We also want you to, if you're interested, you can spotlight the speaker by using the side-by-side -side speaker option in the top right-hand corner of your screen under the view feature. Um, today's presentation will run about 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for q and I'll wrap up the program by about one o'clock, but Tom has agreed to stay on for an additional 15 minutes to continue the discussion so if you'd like to stay on, uh, feel free to do so. Um, and remember that because we have large numbers today, please, if you have questions during the presentation, use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen and we will try to address all those questions during the Q&A period. Um, and before we close the session today, we'll be selecting a lucky winner of our Expo Door Prize. So now I'm pleased to introduce Professor Thomas Visser, Director of the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Vermont, where he teaches courses on researching historic buildings, architectural conservation, and preservation planning and theory. He's the author of Porches of North America, published by the University Press of New England, and numerous professional reports and nominations to the National Register of Historic Places. His award-winning Field Guide to New England Barns and Farm Buildings was also published by the University Press of New England and happens to be my favorite book. Um, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Tom. Thank you very much, Tom, for joining us today. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the invitation to uh, talk about one of my favorite uh, uh, subjects here. And it's wonderful to uh, see the turnout and uh, to connect with many, many people. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the opportunities to chat a bit uh, after the talk and uh, hear how everybody's doing as we're going through these, these challenging times. You know, I, I, uh, I really think that, um, yeah, over the past year, it's been, gosh, uh, these have been times for a certain amount of reflection, uh, and I'm sure many of you are all facing the same sort of thing. And when we can't get out and about, well, what do we have to think about and what do we have to uh, 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 do for projects and so on? And uh, I think for many, including myself, it's been an opportunity to get things organized around the house, including digging through old boxes of photographs and rereading re books and and on and on and on. And, and so I think this was a it's, it's a nice opportunity to be able to bring all of these things together a little bit and to share with uh, uh, everyone out there uh, and hopefully as a, as a way to uh, uh, spark some ideas and, and uh, promote some engagement all, all around this theme of, of porches. Uh, so let me just check here uh, on my screen. So, uh, do do you do you see the the the, uh, the first slide there, with the uh, with the with the with White House and so on? Great. All right, we're on the same page with the with the technology. Anyway, um, you know, my interest in porches has been has been well, quite literally, uh, I I think for much of my life. But it was really uh, an incident that happened when I started as a um, uh, professional doing research on historic property shortly after I, I, I graduated from the University of Vermont Historic Preservation Program. And I was reviewing a, um, a survey that had been done of, uh, of a historic Vermont village. And um, what I found was that a number of what I thought were beautiful historic buildings 
in the downtown area of the of the community had not been included in the state historic sites and structure surveys, whereas some others had been. And I'm, and I was rather puzzled because from the age and everything else, I, I was wondering why some had been excluded. But by looking more carefully, it became apparent that whoever had done the survey years and years before, they had not included some of the buildings because the style of the porches didn't match the style of the rest of the house. And therefore, there was this concern that there may not have been uh, this uh, congruity uh, in those styles. And the assumption was, that, well, this is an alteration. It changed the appearance. Therefore, it had uh, uh, diminished the integrity of the property. And I, and I, and I started to think about that. And, and um, uh, indeed, uh, this is, was sort of the spur from an academic uh, uh, perspective to dig deeper into the history of porches so that rather than looking at porches as, oh, I don't know, shall we say the tail on the dog uh, from a perspective of architectural history, I said, let's look at porches as something in their own right that happened to be attached to a variety of buildings. And so we might have a, uh, a, an Italianate style porch on a Greek revival style building, or it might be a colonial revival style uh, porch on an Italianate style building or whatever. And does that necessarily <laughs> diminish its historic significance? Uh, so anyway, that was, that was the start. And I think in today's world, as we are becoming much more sensitive to issues of integrity within the field of historic preservation and really broadening our understanding of the, shall we say, character defining features of neighborhood to include a broader range of properties. We're moving away from some of that, shall we say, kind of strict architectural history interpretation of, of what uh, uh, may be worthy of of uh, acknowledgement, recordation, preservation, and so on, to becoming more inclusive, particularly looking at properties that may have gone through some changes. Nevertheless, those changes may have a story to tell that actually does contribute to the history and the significance of the property, the neighborhood, the community, uh, and so on. So this is a broad area of discussion, particularly as we are looking with more um, sensitivity, if you will, towards diversity related uh, uh, topics uh, that um, I'm, I'm really encouraging people to, again, not look too strictly, if you will, on architectural style as sort of a primary uh, filter uh, for assessing significance, but to really look, about, uh, look at layers of history. So um, porches, I will argue, are, are one of those typical kind of alterations that have been made to many, many houses and other buildings over time for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that because they're out, shall we say, in the weather, they may be prone to deterioration at a faster rate than the, the, the core of the building. And that may have some impacts on uh, uh, the impetus to change them, but also, Porches can be somewhat less capital uh, intensive to, uh, uh, to build or to modify. So we're often seeing these kinds of adaptations that have been happening for generations. Uh, so again, uh, it kind of fits into uh, the nature of this uh, uh, architectural feature. When doing the research uh, ultimately that, that led to my, my book, Porches of North America, uh, at first, I was a bit um, surprised that there had not been as much scholarly research on the topic as, as I might have anticipated. And what I found were beautiful, shall we say, coffee table books, beautiful photographs, uh, and, and so on. And also very, you know, uh, good, strong scholarly discussions uh, about porches when they fit within that standard rubric of standard architectural styles. But what I really wanted to do with this research was to branch out and look at kind of the public history perspective, the cultural history, heritage more broadly. Uh, and for that, what I found were, were that um, using primary sources such as uh, letters, journals, and especially 
old photographs, postcards, and so on. This was the real treasure trove, if you will, for information to get a better understanding of how porches uh, have appeared and have been used. So I think this is, this is kind of this area. And one of the things that came out of this, this research was this notion of porches as liminal spaces. I don't know if, sure if everyone's familiar with that term of liminality, but it is a word that is used to describe places or things that are happening that are in between, sort of this in betwixt in between phase. So if we're not completely indoors or outdoors, we could be on the porch. It's a liminal space. It's this sort of extended threshold, this transitional place that's a bit of this, it's a little bit of that. It's sort of, it's an and place as opposed to an or place, if I could put it uh, uh, that way. Um, so anyway, uh, I really, you know, finding that uh, these types of places have had very special uses as gathering places, uh, certainly as places for people to be photographed, uh, especially in the days when one needed to have uh, a, a lot of light. What better place than the front porch for the family to sit out there on the steps on a sunny afternoon? And there they are. I mean, they're on a stage. They're almost on a sort of a metaphorical pedestal. Uh, and it, it just, there's a house in the background. And so there's this wonderful genre, if you will, of family photos on the porches and on porch steps. And so indeed, from doing this research, um, uh, there are a lot of kind of nuanced subtleties that might be picked out of some of these, uh, uh, these images. Uh, as I mentioned through this, um, you know, with, with our, with our COVID uh, lockdown and so on, it provided me and I'm sure many, many others with the opportunities to kind of dig through some of their uh, family, family archives, the family records and so on. This is one of the, the, the favorite uh, images that I, I rediscovered, I guess, you know, uh, I know I had it, but where was it? <laughs> one of those sort of things. This is a slide that my father took in 1963 of the bicentennial celebration of Moultonboro, New Hampshire. I was living in Moultonboro at the time. I was a kid growing up there. And that porch on the right, the old country store porch, was the community focal point, the gathering place. Not that we would have big gatherings, but you know, it was just the place, maybe to go to pick up the mail, which was just around the corner in the back wing of the building, or maybe it was just to buy some penny candy or, or just to sit out and see what was going on. It was that informal place where we, we made connections, we maintained connections, and it, it, and it really served a, uh, a vital but subtle community function. And so too, when we go through the history, we see here's an illustration from Harper's Magazine uh, from the, uh, from the uh, 1870s, I think this one was, you know, showing that the, uh, the sort of the general store, the country store and the porch on it really served as that community gathering place, the focal place, that's where the signs would go up, the notices for public meetings. And still we see that again, <laughs> from the archives. I think I took this photo around 1985 in Romney, but you know, here we are, Miller's General Store at the time, you know, there's the gas pump, there's the ice machine, the newspapers, the, there would be brooms, uh, you know, uh, bird seed, you name it. It's, it's probably going to be out on the porch. And, and, it, and what a wonderful place for those informal community uh, exchanges to, uh, to happen. We also certainly see more formalized uses of porches as it, on, on this inn um, in Vermont and South Hero, where on the front, uh, you know, there is that, uh, you know, beautifully maintained uh, kind of public entrance to the business. Whereas on the side, there's the side porch, which clearly is more of the entrance for the, uh, those that are working there or are living there or whatever. So there's symbolic association uh, going on with the way these porches uh, have been designed uh, and, and, and used. So again, we can really think of uh, porches in communities as these liminal spaces. And again, this whole, the whole idea here is these are the type of places where events may happen, 
that are not planned, but that are the sort of connections that may just not have happened anywhere else, that can be enormously meaningful for many people's lives. Um, it's also a place where particularly, shall we say, in the 19th century, to a certain degree today too, um, we can think of porches as a realm that offers public privacy. If I can bring those two co concepts together. It's a place where one could be available, but also do it in a respectable way. If you're following the sort of the, the nuances here. Uh, this is down at Oak Bluffs uh, on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the opportunity to to sit with a friend and have a chat and someone may pass along and that will open up another conversation and, and so on. Porches also have long served as uh, a focal points for important events, uh, arrivals, departures, uh, uh, special gatherings uh, here uh, at a, um, a hotel. Uh, it's actually, last I know, it's still standing. It's in pretty rough shape, but down in Clarendon Springs, uh, uh, Vermont. Uh, and another one of my favorites, because I grew up in this neighborhood in Santa Harbor, New Hampshire, the Garnet Inn. Wonderful photo from the uh, early 20th century. And it just that sort of sense of when the uh, uh, the guests have just step off, stepped off of the uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 steamboat uh, the the Mount, the Mount Washington and they and they come up the hill and they're being welcomed at the at the inn the the, the staff would come out and again this is a sort of symbolic type of activity that it doesn't happen on the street it doesn't quite happen on the inside it is the stage it is the community stage where these special events uh, can can uh, can occur. But also, there is this notion of porch etiquette, okay? And it's this idea that there are certain behaviors that are um, um, understood to occur on porches that perhaps don't happen in other places. And le let me just read you a, a quote. This was published in the 1880s. Uh, the author was Mary Elizabeth Wilson Sherwood, and uh, the book was The American Code of Manners. And she wrote, it is quite uh, proper at a watering place to speak without an introduction to those whom you meet every day. Gentlemen should always raise their hats to their fair fellow boarders and the acquaintance of ladies on a hotel piazza can hurt no one. The day the party leaves the hotel, that day the acquaintance can cease if the people so choose. So, so, you know, we, we get this whole sense of the porch as this, this place where there are these social uh, 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 endeavors that are, are, are occurring. And indeed, we could see that places uh, like this are, are in, in essence, as established to help support a complex web of social interests, uh, as well as certain nuanced behaviors and even appearances. Uh, you know, so much in the way that uh, clothing <clears throat> may be worn for appearance and not just for comfort, uh, so too uh, do we have this notion of when one out, when one is out on the porch, one is a bit out there on display, uh, and uh, so. Um, the uh, uh, another sort of image here, the, the, the beautiful veranda on the, uh, the new ocean house. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, as with many of these uh, grand hotels in New England, uh, this one uh, was uh, destroyed in 1969, but uh, it, it served as that, 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 that place to be seen, shall we say, on the North Shore in Swampscott, uh, uh, Massachusetts for, for generations. Uh, so um, thus by even just kind of relaxing out on, on the porch with a, with a cool drink uh, or reclining in a hammock or in a day bed, uh, occupants of porches and verandas 
could comfortably reside alone or together, sometimes in pairs or sometimes in groups, within partial sight and earshot of other people. Uh, and this could provide socially discrete opportunities for public access and even subtly chaperone social exchanges that might otherwise have been possible to achieve, especially during the Victorian era. Which then of course leads us to the other area of, of, of porch life and that's porches by night. Uh, and uh, this, this, this notion that the opportunities for social engagements would broaden uh, 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 immensely uh, what with traditions of courtship rituals and so on that would be that that would be uh, uh, tended to happen on the porch. Last night on the back porch was one of the hit songs of the 1920s. But also the porch itself, its orientation, its dimensions, and so on. This could also have uh, a major uh, role in how uh, the functionality uh, of 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 the of the place. Uh, may be uh, impacted. Uh, here's then a, a, a quote from E.C. Gardner who wrote in 1875 in uh, Illustrated Homes. He says, at the east side where the views are the best, we want a large square veranda, not a rope walk, a tantalizing strip of balcony, barely sufficient for a man to walk back or forth for a single or a single row of seats, but large enough for a dozen people to group around in easy chairs without danger of falling off the ed edges. Summer afternoons, this will be the most valuable room in the house. But perhaps it was US President Rutherford Hayes shown here sitting on uh, his uh, veranda with his wife Lucy, uh, who best summed up Victorian era feelings towards porches when he, he recorded in his journal in 1873, quote, the best part of the present house is the veranda. I would enlarge it, I want a veranda with a house attached. But for some people, men and women, uh, and certainly older people, the lonely, uh, and so on, the veranda could also provide a very welcome alternative to the confines and indeed isolation of the house. Uh, we can almost see then that the porch could serve as a, a, a metaphor of these liminal tensions between a, a thirst for connections and then also that fear of, of, of loneliness and uh, fears of, 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 of security. Um, there was a quote in Sherwood Anderson's uh, 1919 novel, A Winesburg, Ohio, that I wanted to share with you that touches on some of the psychological uh, domain uh, uh, here. Uh, so, and, and I'll quote now. Now, as the old man walked uh, up and down on the veranda, his hands moving about nervously, he was hoping that George Willard would come and spend the evening with him. After the wagon containing the berry pictures had passed, he went across the field to the tall mustard weeds and climbing the rail fence, peered anxiously along the road to town. For a moment, he stood thus rubbing his hands together, looking up and down the road, and then fear overcame him. He ran back and again upon the porch, he sat at his own house. So porches have long provided this, this liminal space also for solemn occasions. Uh, indeed, they're a place that could be used to acknowledge that transition between this world and the next, especially during the 19th century and early 20th century when there was the practice of holding wakes and memorial services uh, at the homes of the deceased. And if there was not enough room inside or if there were a large number of people anticipated to come, uh, the, uh, the casket uh, and the body might actually be displayed out on, on, the, on the veranda where people might also be able to pass by to wish their condolences uh, for those uh, who, who would be grieving. 
But in the 20th century, uh, there started to be a shift away from so many of these kind of Victorian uh, customs, attitudes, feelings, uh, and so on, particularly a movement away from this uh, Victorian, if you will, obsession with uh, fancy embellishments and outward appearances and so on. And as we moved into the progressive era, there was much more, shall we say, public interest uh, and consensus around focusing on functionality and restraining public display. And indeed, there was a growing thirst uh, for, uh, for privacy uh, that started to uh, have an impact on, on porches and how they were used. In 1922, House Beautiful magazine had picked up on this trend uh, and they observed that uh, for many people, there was this uh, um, kind of shifting away from using uh, porches and quote, the increase in motor traffic, the dust and proximity of other houses tend to make the front porch less desirable each year. And so as it became less desirable for porches to gather outside on the front porch, they, would, they were moving to areas where more privacy uh, could be found. In some cases, it was, it was a side porch that would be uh, uh, constructed on the house or a, um, a, a rear porch. Of course, the back porches had long been used for a variety of functional purposes, particularly, uh, and uh, you know, indeed, whether it was washing the clothes plucking the chickens, uh, 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 on and on. Uh, back porches also had long uh, served as this kind of private realm. And so during the 1920s and 1930s, we start to see more uh, uh, kind of use of the back porch as this, uh, this uh, place of, of, of comfort and retreat. Um, but then by the 1950s and 1960s, this kind of trend towards uh, the, the uh, shall we say, kind of public um, goals for more and more privacy, especially what with the, 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 the shift by many, many people to suburban neighborhoods and, and uh, wanting separation from the cities and, 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 and so on, we see this being also manifest in the design of, of, of some buildings where there were no longer a, as much a, 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 of a front porch, maybe a very shallow practical play to, place to shelter the, the, the rain of somebody who were coming or going, but indeed the social events would be happening in the backyard. It would be the, uh, uh, the patio, maybe there's a pool or, or whatever, but it's within this private realm and one would not be entertaining the guests and having a big uh, a, a gathering, if you will, on a front porch. And indeed, at the same time, we also know through the record that uh, because the front porches were not being used as much and because they were sort of seeing as quote unquote old fashioned, we also then were, were seeing porches being removed from, from buildings, uh, older buildings. What I'd like to do in the, uh, in the remaining uh, uh, time is to uh, uh, talk about some different types of, of porches. Uh, to, uh, and I really want to start with an acknowledgement that uh, uh, porch type structures, to the best of our knowledge, especially from the outstanding work that archaeologists have been doing over the years, porch like structures have been serving people in North America and certainly beyond for, for, uh, for thousands of years. And uh, perhaps one of the kind of best examples of, of, of that is the Ramada uh, that we, we can see here. This is a photo taken in the 1930s by the Historic American Building Survey. And it's showing this porch-like structure, this shade rendering space uh, adjacent to the more enclosed protective space where uh, a family or, or an extended family or a group of, of, uh, of, of Native American uh, uh, indigenous peoples uh, would be living. And indeed we find from archeological evidence, the so-called post molds that such open perhaps roofed but open walled 
uh, uh, features were uh, sometimes found on a wide variety of, of, of dwelling forms in North America before European contact. But when we think about the sort of traditions, the cultural traditions and so on that were, were, were brought uh, to the new world uh, from, uh, from Europe and, and, uh, uh, and, and the old world in general, we can certainly see that simple open structures or very elaborate uh, uh, porch-like structures have been long associated uh, with a wide variety of cultures and civilizations. So we find them recorded in uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. On the, there's this wonderful portico uh, on the uh, Acropolis uh, in, in Athens. There are recessed porches on Renaissance cathedrals. And so what this really does show is that the porch has long served as a, uh, an important part of, 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 of human activity and experience. When it comes to the you know, specific history of porches in New England, we can look back at some beautiful uh, examples of, uh, of classical forms that were uh, being uh, built as early as the 1700s. Uh, here, for example, is the uh, a Redwood Library in Newport, uh, uh, Rhode Island, that has this uh, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, temple-like form to the to the front porch. It's it's a it's, it's a uh, it's a Doric uh, porch. Uh, also, think about uh, King's Chapel uh, in, uh, uh, in in Boston, another one of Peter Harrison's uh, masterpiece uh, works. This then immediately leads to a, a kind of a, a recognition to discussion about the classical orders. So whether they're the Greek orders or the Roman uh, 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 variations on them, we can describe many of these porticos and, and colonnades uh, in terms of which of the classical orders were used as a reference when the designs were being done. So now we're really getting into an area where there's there's a, there's a fair amount of overlap with regards to terminology. I like to use the word porch very, very broadly and think about various sort of uh, uh, words that could describe different types of porches. So in this case, we could think of a portico that might be uh, in a, it's a classical form uh, supported by two, three, four, five, six, even maybe eight uh, columns uh, what we might call a portico. Uh, whereas if there is a long, long line of columns, that's typically referred to as a colonnade. Of course, there is somewhat of an overlap between six and eight. Is it a portico or a colonnade? It depends a bit on, on its function and, and quite frankly, uh, tradition. So here we have uh, in Athens, uh, 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 in the Plaka district, it's a, it's, it's a walkable distance uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, the Parthenon uh, is the, uh, 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 this temple that was designed uh, uh, by ancient Greeks, uh, you know, uh, over uh, 2000, uh, what, uh, uh, 460 some odd years ago, uh, a Doric peristyle colonnade. So there are these columns that are going all around uh, the perimeter of, of, of this temple. But we see this notion of using columns getting picked up by um, uh, Charles Bullfinch uh, with the Massachusetts State House, uh, as well as on the on the front of the main State House. The New Hampshire State House also has the these paired columns on the front uh, portico, as does the Vermont State House, where we have this uh, uh, Doric uh, portico from the 1830s. Uh, indeed, even the uh, Boston Customs House, also designed by the same architect uh, as the Vermont State House, Amy Burnham Young, has this same kind of Doric portico uh, serving as an, as an entrance, very much like that uh, a temple I showed you in, in Athens. And of course, it, this, is the, this is the base of what was developed into the, uh, uh, the skyscraper, uh, Boston's first skyscraper, the, uh, uh, the 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 uh, customs house tower. So we see these Greek revival uh, porticos, beautiful examples. Here, two more exa uh, uh, well, an example uh, by Amy Burnham Young on the left, 
uh, Windsor House, uh, both from 1840. Uh, in New Hampshire, the uh, Joseph Wentworth House in, in Sandwich, New Hampshire is a beautiful uh, later example of the vernacular uh, Greek revival style with a front portico supported by square posts, not quite as literal to the uh, 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 kind of the, the, the Greek style, but it's absolutely uh, an example of how these styles tend to evolve and morph a little bit. Here in Manchester, uh, we see this beautiful neoclassical revival style portico from around 1900 on this, this uh, 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 nice uh, uh, apartment house uh, on Hanover Street. And then of course, there's the portico uh, at Plymouth Rock uh, by McKimmead and White, freestanding, but it's still, it's called a portico. We also have entry porches. First of all, some of them were enclosed like the, Hush, the uh, Cushing Homestead uh, from the uh, 1600s in Hingham, Massachusetts. Rokeby Museum in Ferrisburg has an open front entry porch. They, when this was built, the story is the carpenters could hear the, the, uh, the cannon fire of, of, of battleships uh, on Lake Champlain during the War of 1812. It's still there and it's in a remarkable state of preservation. So we find through these historic photographs, these front porches and how they have long served as these places for, uh, for, for gatherings. And even today are moving into the 20th century, sort of that formal front entry porch is uh, a, a common function, especially looking here at a, an example in the colonial revival style. We also have balcony porches, so two-story porches. So uh, here a uh, kind of a, a from the 1830s, uh, 1840s, some examples, uh, a, a ferry keeper's place on the left, a uh, general store on the right, again, providing both private and public uh, spaces. But one of, one of my favorites, of course, is what we refer to as a gable loggia, uh, this kind of recessed balcony up in the gable end of a building. And there is this amazing uh, uh, kind of connection, if you will, of these gable loggias that extends all the way from the Eastern townships of Quebec down along the Connecticut River Valley, New Hampshire and Vermont into Massachusetts and so on, following the old stagecoach routes going up to Montreal. And indeed, many of these places were along that, that route and some of them did serve as public houses uh, uh, along the way. Uh, so again, a, a remarkable sort of specialized uh, type. Yes, they are found elsewhere, but there really is this concentration straddling the Connecticut uh, River particularly. Excuse me, Tom, we're a little past the 10 minute warning, but don't rush because it's all fascinating stuff. Yep. Okay, well, I, I'm, that, that's great. I just wanted to kind of wrap things up on the, on the history, by again, by talking about terminology, this notion of the porch, the veranda and the piazza are very, very uh, common and important forms for, for buildings through the 19th century. Uh, here again, Center Harbor, New Hampshire, the old center house. Uh, fancy verandas were being brought in with designs from, from England in the early 1800s. We see an example of this lattice veranda from the 1840s that is still preserved. It's still the original lattice uh, out there and how this became a, a, a form, Gothic verandas, okay? Uh, another form from the 1840s that we find on beautiful landmark quality buildings across New England from that, from that period, or vernacular uh, uh, verandas on Gothic revival style buildings. So uh, uh, here we have another Manchester of uh, Vermont, uh, uh, New Hampshire ex example on a Gothic revival style house with a nice shallow side veranda. Everywhere we look, we're we, 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 we find these, these porch uh, features, even sort of late high Victorian Gothic verandas are, are very common. Bracketed verandas. Uh, again, going back to A.J. Downing, he talks about the bracket as an important character defining feature. Here's a nice example from Center Sandwich, New Hampshire of an 1872 Italianate style home with this beautiful veranda supported by these bracketed uh, posts. Uh, and the Octagon House in Manchester, once again, 
looking at the details of the front porch and the side porch, we see those brackets. Uh, the uh, Island Villa Hotel on Lake Champlain from the early 20th century, these small brackets are, are up there. So then we get into and this is the Queen Anne style, which is really sort of the, the culmination of so much of what we're talking about, this porch era. The New Hampshire Veterans Association headquarters in Weir's Beach. I mean, look at these turned posts, absolutely uh, uh, beautiful character defining features. The old Holderness Inn, once again, that wrap around veranda really made the place. Or these Richardsonian Romanesque porches, uh, like on the Fairbanks Museum and other places of the 1880s and 1890s were so important. Shingled porches, so many examples we see during, with the shingle style uh, as, as well. Bungalows, uh, craftsman homes, again, porches serving as the, uh, uh, the primary function. So let me just skip ahead a little bit, talk about the colonial revival porches. Uh, once again, uh, one could purchase these from a catalog and add a porch to a beautiful older home. And again, it's a significant character defining feature. Side porches, important. Back porches, we've touched about a little bit. Uh, again, uh, cure porches, another whole type where uh, in the early 20th century, for tuberculosis, this was a, a treatment. Uh, sleeping porches, uh, we find then these typically screened in second story porches that are in many communities. Screening themselves transform the way porches have been uh, used. Um, and then sun porches, once again, another transformation uh, with operable sash that can greatly extend the usability uh, uh, over time. <laughs> But I wanted to wrap things up in the last few minutes to touch on the theme of porch maintenance. And specifically what there are kind of a number of key parts of porches to think about. You know, they're simple in a way. It's the roofs, the supports, the railings, the floor and steps, and the base and the, and the footings. So uh, again, if I can just back up here, one way when there are severe issues on a porch that say the roof can be supported and then the work can be done on the foundation by propping it up often with these diagonal uh, brackets. You'll probably, or, or, or diagonal uh, supports. You may see this from time to time. You don't have to tear off the porch if the lower uh, uh, level needs to be fixed. There may be ways to suspend it in, in essence. When we start to see drips like this and peeling paint around the eaves of a porch, that's a red flag. There are leaks up there. Many porch roofs are shallow, we may not see the evidence of the deterioration. But when we see uh, leaks like this, we know that there may be water dripping inside that could ultimately cause severe damage. One approach that lately, I, this is my own back porch. You know, I, it, the older roofing was, was worn out. I put on a beautiful dark green shingle roof to match the rest of the house. And oh my goodness, when this, uh, within, within the next week or so, I could not believe how much more how much hotter that back porch was in the morning sun. So I literally have cooled off the roof on my back porch by painting it white. It's now reflective. And, and uh, when I redid the shingles, I, I put on a, a, as light a shingle as I could so that it, I could go out there and stay cool. Um, posts, railings, these are character defining features. There are issues with uh, uh, building codes and so on. Uh, yes, if it's, if it's up at a certain height, there may need to be a supplemental rail, uh, but if we can maintain the, 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 uh, the features uh, that are there, maintain that integrity, uh, that's certainly preferable. So yeah, here again, a typical porch repair, temporary props so that it can be, uh, the floor can be uh, repaired or, or replaced. This is typically done with jacking. I mean, you know, on many, many porches because you know, the only thing that's supporting many porches just might be a pipe or a pile of bricks or concrete blocks, and it may not, they may not have a deep footing. They may rise and fall with the frost and so on. So it's not unusual to need to jack up that porch a half an inch or an inch in the spring to bring it back up to uh, uh, where, where it should be. Routine maintenance, and, and so many times these porches literally have uh, a, a lattice screen or something like that around them so one can get access to these areas 
to do these kind of incremental uh, repairs. The same way with putting up screening to keep, uh, uh, you know, the, the 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 squirrels, especially the skunks, out from under the porch. That might be one other one other thing that uh, might be uh, uh, preferable. So, time for questions, comments, and sharing of memories. If anyone will also like, I I I like to open the floor to that. So, thank you all very much. Um, thank you so much. That was so fascinating, and I think we could sit here for another hour listening to you. Um, so I, because we have so many people, it's hard to open this up. So if you have a comment or question you'd like to share, please put it in the chat um, and we'll try to address it. I don't, there aren't any comment, there aren't, there's nothing in there right now. So I do have a couple questions. I mean, there were a lot of comments throughout your presentation, Tom, and somebody pointed out that they wish they could just sit at one of your lectures because, or all of them, because it's just so fascinating. Um, so that's a whole nother story, like go to UVM and sign up for historic <laughs> preservation classes, right? Well, I uh, wish we were all sitting around on a porch together right now. <laughs> I know, I wish we were. Oh, uh, here's a question. Here's some couple questions coming in. Great. Um, what? Can you address blue ceilings? Oh, what a wonderful topic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's been this long tradition of painting the ceilings blue. And, you know, it's one of these kind of cultural um, uh, practices. Uh, of course, people are going to say, well, the blue, the blue is going to uh, discourage the mosquitoes and so on. Who knows if that's actually based in science. But I think there's this notion of the blue sky up there, too. But it's one of these little things. It's like, why do we paint barns red? It, it's a tradition. And, and it's, it's, you know, uh, we see it in a lot of areas. I certainly have seen so many blue ceilings. They just, it adds a little bit of something special uh, to a porch. On my own house, the ceilings were never blue and I haven't painted them blue, but you know, it, 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 it certainly can, can contribute to the, the feeling. If they were blue, yeah, why not? Okay. And someone that we kind of went through this quickly, but, um your images. The evo can you speak on the evolution of the sleeping porch a little bit? Yeah, right. Well, great. Uh, uh, sure. What a, what a, you know, if we had another half hour. <laughs> so I appreciate your patience as I skim through the, those, uh, those many images at, at the end. But this is a wonderful topic that I'm glad we can talk about. What, what there really seems to be is a transition that was happening in the early 20th century uh, from this notion of of, of breathing fresh air as a way to help with um, a breathing problems. And especially during that period where tuberculosis, of course, was a terrible disease that was affecting virtually almost every family. And so th there was this discovery in Europe and then a uh, Dr. Trudeau in uh, Saranac Lake, uh, New York, uh, established a, a, a clinic, a, uh, a, a sanitarium uh, for, tuberculosis sufferers that brought about their, the main treatment was there for them to be living on a porch day and night, all year round, breathing the fresh air and not being confined to the indoor air. Uh, and so of course, in today's issue, were issues with the COVID, we also know how important access to fresh air uh, is on, on many, many levels. So that then became sort of a broad public understanding that breathing fresh air and sleeping in the fresh air, especially was good for one's health, which by the 1920s led to uh, this broad uh, um, sort of adoption of, of sleeping porches for those who could afford it. Uh, um, Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt opens with a wonderful passage about waking up uh, on the sleeping porch. For any of you who have slept on a porch at night, especially during the summer, there's something quite magical uh, about the sound of the uh, of the uh, you know of, of, of nature. So, uh, I, I think you know, yeah. Does, I hope that answers the question of our sort of the history from the cure porch to the sleeping porch uh, as a, kind of a way that the public embraced it. Okay. Someone asked, what type of porch is on the pavilion in Montpelier? Uh, I would have to look at a picture to remember the style. That was reconstructed uh, 
in the 1970s, uh, the pavilion was a hotel there. The hotel was taken down. And I think there are two story, if I recall, it's a two story uh, uh, porch. Um, you know, once again, is it a porch? Is it a veranda? Uh, we could call it both. I, I think the other topic, if, if I can uh, kind of um, uh, morph a little bit, this word piazza uh, is sometimes used in the literature. And what we have also found is that it, there may, it may have been in the early 20th century that many uh, New England residents would have referred to that as a piazza, whereas people from other parts of the country would have referred to it as a veranda and others would have referred to it as a porch. <laughs> so you see, we kind of get all, all of the above. It's not one or the other. It just depends on the, the, ling ling the uh, linguistic usages. Okay. Um, what role did air conditioning play in the demise of the porch? Wonderful question, because it had a major, major impact. Again, I mean, yes, the car traffic, the dust, the dirt, the noise was, was that first push away from the, from the porch. But when air conditioning became very common, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, it, it had a, an enormous impact. For me, this really came, uh, uh, I came face to face with it uh, when doing my research for my porch book. I expected to find wonderful examples of porches uh, in the South and in the Southwest. And really what I found was, of course, that when air conditioning came along, yeah, there was just not so much construction of, of porches on, on houses because of the, of the heat issue. Hmm. Okay, there's a bunch of questions here relating to porch floors. Good. Um, tongue and groove, space boards, pressure treated, sort of the whole evolution. I think overall, um, I mean, we, we, we do find uh, uh, tongue and groove boards or just uh, uh, square edge boards that are, that are butted together. It really depends on how much exposure there will be to the, um, uh, to the weather as to whether it makes sense for the porch floorboards to drain or whether they're to be something, a surface that can be sealed. Normally for the porch, there's enough overhang on the roof so that we're not getting rain coming in every day. We're not getting snow piled up. And so having the tongue and groove uh, certainly became common uh, by the 1880s, if not earlier, and it continues to be uh, so today. Personally, you know, I sweep my porch after every snowstorm so that I minimize the amount of snow that may be penetrating into those wooden floorboards to try to reduce the amount of paint peeling that may happen in the spring or summer. Okay, and someone writes here, um, Sylvia says, my original porch had Douglas fir flooring. She replaced it 20 years ago and it needs to be replaced again. Can you recommend a different product that might be more weather resistant or should she be sealing it or what should she be doing? Uh, I've also, I've kind of learned the hard way through my, 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 my laboratory on my own back porch uh, and uh, no, you know, there's that temptation to go to a pressure treated uh, a wood. It has a different character. In my own experience, the Douglas fir flooring, it is expensive, but it is, it is, it is what was used before for a reason. It is enormously, uh, um, it's, it, 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 it's very durable. So if there's the possibility of, of even patching in, in kind with the same material, uh, typically it's five quarters of an inch thick uh, it may be available uh, in tongue and groove. It's probably not something that one might find at a big, at a big box uh, retailer. One may need to go to a, uh, a, a more specialized lumber yard or building supply place that's selling to contractors to, to, uh, to get that uh, uh, replacement flooring to match in kind. And how about um, painted floors versus non-painted floors? Traditionally, of course, um, um, I mean, before some of these tropical hardwoods uh, uh, came in, uh, the porches floors would, would be painted. I think the other thing here, the, what's important is to try to keep the water out. So, uh, you know, traditionally they would have been sealed with linseed oil and turpentine to uh, really soak in. And then uh, a, uh, a, a porch and deck enamel would have been used. 
There's also a, a, a product, I hope it's still available, called a, a, a deck stain. It, it's thinner in consistency than a porch enamel, but the whole idea is that it, 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 uh, it seeps into the wood and it, and it forms a seal. It's opaque. It would take maybe three or four or five coats rather than the two coats of the porch uh, and deck enamel, but it's much more resistant to peeling uh, in my own experience. So um, yeah, it, it, it kind of depends. I think th this is also true of the steps leading up to the porches that are often made from wood. They're, they're really getting the most exposure and they will typically need annual maintenance. I mean, every spring I out, I'm out there scraping and sealing and then, and then repainting. But putting the sealer in there to keep the water out is, is critically important. Yeah. Okay. And then I know the answer, what you're going to say about this one, but I have to ask the question. Um, what do you think about tracks or other high quality composite flooring for porch flooring where fur is not feasible? Yeah. I mean, as a last resort, I guess we could put it that way. Um, I, I think it, obviously it has some um, um, practicality to it. I mean, there's the appearance issue. Um, um, so I think it, it really has to be a case-by-case -case basis. If, if, if the porch is a significant historic character-defining feature, particularly if there's the goal of preserving its character, maybe it's going to be an issue that might come up if the building is in a historic district and it's subject to, to review then or subject to uh, a state or, or uh, a National Park Service guidelines, uh, say for a investment tax credit projects or anything like that, then one will need to be very careful of, of, about maintaining the, uh, the, the, the same materials or compatible materials and, and, and perhaps not using uh, a synthetic that would be so identifiable as being artificial. Okay, thank you. And one last question here. Could you tell me when porches started being added to 18th and 19th century residential architecture? So if this a house is, did not have one. Yeah, well, th though this, is, this, is, this is wonderful because again, kind of what I talked about in the beginning, you know, uh, there are so many examples of houses that had porches, the porches were removed, another porch went on uh, and, and, and so on. So, I mean, what we find for original uh, construction is that indeed porches were being put on houses well, in the, uh, in the federal period, I mean, there are those formal Georgian uh, uh, porches uh, or porticos or, or whatever, but the sort of the simple, shall we say, shed roof porch, uh, that certainly uh, does, does go back to the early 1800s. I, and I think what I'm trying to say here too is, uh, I mean, it depends on, on what elevation and what exposure, you know, how a, a porch addition would be, uh, would be placed. Uh, the southeast exposure, as I say, if one has a choice, that's what I would recommend uh, if, if there are not you know, major concerns about historic integrity uh, and so on, because you get the morning light. Southwest and west, you get the afternoon heat. You know, they're nice porches, north porches, you know, you don't get as much light. You know, so thinking about the what side of the house to put a porch on really think about the way the the, uh, the sun is moving through the day and how it might be used. Yeah, actually on my house, it's been called a sun liner and we have a big farmer's porch on the south side. And it's wonderful because in the summer, when the sun is high, it shades the rooms of the house. But in the winter, when the sun's lower, that sun actually comes in. So it works really well. Yeah, absolutely. And the in the south, these portions of the south side, often were somewhat shallow. Yep. I mean, I, I think I, I, I showed an example from Sandwich, New Hampshire quickly of a side porch. It's actually, it gets a lot of sun, uh, barely, I don't know if it was five feet deep, uh, but again, it's serving that, that, uh, that shade, uh, but also, uh, uh, you know, letting the sunlight in function. Yeah. All right, one more question and then I'll do my wrap up. Um, for the one hour. And then if you'd like to stay on for an additional 15 minutes, please feel free to do so. But the final question is, what is your advice for meeting current code requirements for 42 inch porch railing on historic buildings? The elongated yeah. balusters are ruinous to the character of the old house, better to add a supplemental piece? 
Absolutely. Yeah. No, this is what I was alluding to basically there at the end. And we've run into it on, on a lot of cases. If at all possible, I think it is best if you can leave the existing parapet wall or railings that are there and then put a supplemental a railing in at that 42 inch code uh, height. It may be as simple as a, as, as a pipe railing or something like that. That is, uh, they can be painted to match the rest of the trim. So it's identifiable as something that's been added. It's providing that safety function, uh, but it isn't, it isn't destroying the character by ripping out the old feature and putting in something that would have a higher proportion. The other thing too is to think about the sight line. If someone is sitting on that porch, uh, that 42 inches is starting to, to potentially block the view. So if it can be done in a way so that uh, one could see through it, uh, it, there might be advantages there. All right, great, thanks, Tom. So at this point, I'm gonna do my wrap up. Um, so Tom, I just wanted to thank you so much. This was fascinating, it really was. I loved all the cultural history and you had amazing historic images. So that was great. Um, I was hoping, as we mentioned, that we could all meet through Zoom today on our porches, but it's uh, Mother Nature has other ideas for us on this Earth Day. It's 37 degrees outside my window in southern New Hampshire with occasional snow. And Tom had said earlier that they have, what, three or four inches of snow in Burlington. So, but I hear the weather's going to be great this weekend. So, hope you can all go out and enjoy your porches. Um, we love getting like-minded folks together to share this type of information, make connections, and offer a dose of energy and inspiration to, through these programs. Thoughtful and experienced presenters like Tom and your great questions and involvement make a huge impact on advancing preservation interests and efforts across New Hampshire. We want you to know the Alliance is here to help and encourage you. Um, and you can check out our website, nhpreservation.org, or send us an email at bt at nhpreservation.org at any time with questions. Um, the next two expo sessions we'll be having are in May, the first week of May. One is on barn history and preservation, and the other is New Hampshire architectural history. Um, visit nhpreservation.org for a complete list of upcoming expo sessions or to register. And we also encourage you to share that link with other family and friends. Um, and also on our expo, um, on the website is our expo guide to 50 products and service providers. Um, if you're in need of anything with your porch renovation or other preservation projects. Um, and for those of you who have been to our in-person expo in the past, you know how we love to give away door prizes as a token of our appreciation. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Maggie Steer, who is going to announce the lucky winner of Guidelines for Porch Repairs and Replacement, a practical workbook to help guide any porch maintenance, repair, or reconstruction project. So Maggie, who is our lucky winner? Our lucky winner today is Judith Kushner. Yay, Judas! <laughs> Judas, <I'm> saying, what? <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> Wonderful. Actually, great because um, we have a porch that's south facing ourselves. Great uh, sun in February, just when you need that coming in. And um, I'm concerned about a porch of our library. Um, so, this will be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for joining today and we will mail that to you, Judith, okay? Thank you. All right. All right, so please watch for a follow-up email I'll be sending tomorrow um, with links to additional preservation resources in the recording of today's session, um, as well as a short survey that will help us plan for future programming. And please help keep the Preservation Alliance vibrant by making a donation or considering a gift of membership. So thanks again to Tom for this wonderful presentation to our Old House and Barn Expo on the Road sponsors listed here on the slide uh, for making this whole um, Expo on the Road possible. And to all of you who are supporters of our critical work to help advance efforts to save and steward special places around New Hampshire. We wish you well and look forward to seeing you at future Alliance programs. So at this time, we'll end our regular hour, but if you would like to stay on for an additional 15 minutes or so of Q&A and discussion, please feel free to do so. 
and enjoy your porches, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Beverly, for hosting this. And uh, best wishes to everybody. We're all in this together. We are. And thanks, Tom, for agreeing to stay on for a few extra minutes. All right, so getting back to some of these questions, wonder, really wonderful comments too about people remembering taking family photos on their back porches. Um, I know I have a picture of my grandfather and his family um, on their back porch in the late 1800s, which is always fun to look at. Let's see, lots of kudos to you, Tom. People from all over, from Texas and all over it's the wonderful place. Wonderful to see so many familiar names. My yeah. goodness, my goodness. Well, feel free to reach <laughs> out. Say hello, Tom. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me see what other recommendation, Tom. We talked about um, paint and ways to help weatherize the floor. Do you have any particular products that, if it's an unpainted surface, that you like to put on to weatherize? Well, you know, the, the sort of one of the, the traditional uh, sealants, as I say, was linseed oil and, and, and turpentine, but there are also a good number of, of uh, penetrating sealers that are available today. I think if the, if the goal is to maintain that appearance of a wood finish, ideally it would be oil-based, okay? Uh, okay? You want something that's going to penetrate and protect uh, and not just something that's gonna form a film on the top that could wear away or, or, or so on. Uh, there are some emulsion based ones, but I, I, I've, again, it should be something that's made for ideally, they, I mean, they're sold for parts and decks and uh, they, they're not cheap, but you know, it, it's that balance of durability. And they do work and you just have to remember to use them every few years, right? Well, th this is it. It's depending on the amount of weathering. Uh, you know, like I'm I said, I mean, for my own, I've got my front porch. I just, do you have a place for this or I can? Upstairs. Oh, okay. And, you know, some, some, uh, some steps I, I, I paint every year. Uh, yeah. uh, other, other areas, it might be every five years or 10 years. Uh, but so keeping, keeping a finger on the pulse of the, the health of the, uh, of, of the wood is critically important. And at some point, as we discussed, yeah, it may be necessary to cut out some of those floorboards, especially around the edges where the rain has come in and do a replacement in kind before the whole, the whole uh, deck has to be replaced. Here's a good question relating to screening. Um, what did the widespread use of screening do to the use of the front porch? <laughs> Wonderful question. It transformed the use of the porches, you know, particularly in, in uh, these places uh, where we all know what happens uh, at, at when sunset uh, occurs in the, uh, in, the, in the summer months and the mosquitoes start to uh, come to feed, you know, to have that screening on the porch, to be able to sit out there in the, in the evening. You know, like I say, I mean, growing up, I, we lived on that front porch, actually it was a side porch, but we lived on that porch all summer long because of the screening. Without the screening, it would just be maybe for, for lunch. But, but with the screening, it was breakfast, lunch, dinner, and sleeping. You know, it, it, perfect. But was your porch an old porch that the screening was added? Yeah, exactly. The, well, the house was built in uh, 1912, facing southeast. And it appears that the, uh, the screening was added probably shortly thereafter. Um, but it, this is quite common for it to be retrofitted. Yeah, yeah. All right, here's a good one. Any advice on appropriate coating for metal porch roofing? The older tar products we used to have change content no longer last. What are, what has resulted in, that has, which has resulted in leaking through and damage to the wood. So basically talking about a metal roof and you it know, might be time for a new roof. Well, exactly. If it's time for a new roof, if, 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 um, uh, if, if, if the slope will, will uh, is suitable, uh, certainly a metal roof is is desirable from a long-term perspective of durability uh, standing seam type if if needed or even a soldered seam if it's very flat these get expensive uh, nevertheless they will last a century uh, so um, yeah uh, check out check out the price alternatives uh, but uh, you know uh, particularly on those roofs on porches 
that are not particularly obvious or well seen from outside because of the lower pitch. Mm -hmm. if, if it does have enough pitch so that it is seen, then you would want to think about compatibility with the other roofs. But uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, me of metal roofs in, in, in general, if one can, can, can get them these days at an affordable price. Once, right, once you put one on, you're never gonna have to replace that in your lifetime. Um, here's a good question. I, th I think there's a word missing. When a porch has been removed, I think, I think it's porch step, has been removed as a granite slab historically preferred replacement. I think sh she's referring to a step. I live in a- I historic... actually mean the whole porch. Uh, the whole porch. Oh, yeah. okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I live in a historic district. This has been an option used. Thank you. The whole porch? There were porches built on most of these houses in this district in the 30s and 40, 1830s and 40s. And uh, a lot of them were removed, unfortunately, because I agree with Mr. V uh, Professor Visser's high opinion of porches, and they add a great deal to uh, living somewhere, but uh, there a lot of them have been gone. But they've put granite slabs as replacement with improper height and everything. And I, I, it's like they're death traps. And I just was wondering if that's a historic option or this was just the idiosync idiosyncrasy of the fellow that was doing this. <laughs> it's a, it sounds like that may be the case, but I, you know, I, one. Quick thought here. I mean, obviously, without seeing it and knowing knowing the history of it, it's hard to uh, pass a judgment from a distance. But on this question about the history of whether there had been a porch there, whatever, from a historical research point of view, I'd certainly encourage people to look at the old Sanborn insurance maps if the, if they're in a downtown area, because they those Sanborn maps will typically show the outline of where a porch may have been in the in the 1800s. Uh, that subsequently may have been re removed. So if there's some proof that it was there on those maps and maybe some physical evidence, then to put it back, one may have a head start, especially if it's subject to design review. I have photos of the, po wow, the, the porches. Yeah, historic photos. So anyway, I just was wondering about the, the granite slabs because I hadn't seen them anywhere else but this Hillsborough Center Historic District. And I just wondered if it was something that was done. Okay, thank you for your question, Lori. Um, here's a good one, column relating to columns, Tom. Columns are sound, but the plinths show rot. Epoxy product, proper roof, uh, porch roof, slip in new plinth. What do you recommend for- Very common problem once again, uh, the, that at the basis of these columns, the moisture is, is uh, condensing inside the column, it comes down. This is where we start to see the decay first. Yes, absolutely, if possible, using a an epoxy as a method for repairing it uh, could be a first step as opposed to a replacement or a, or a patch. For the epoxies, however, we really need to understand that for the epoxy fillers to bond, there needs to be uh, an epoxy penetrating uh, uh, a coat that goes on first that really will go into the decayed wood, harden it, and then after that cures, then the patch uh, goes goes on. So certainly there are some uh, um, you know experienced uh, 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 people who are doing these kinds of of, of repairs using these uh, uh, epoxies. But rather than just taking something from a can and putting it on and hoping for the best, it really has to bond well. That's the critical thing there. Okay, thank you. Um, is a historic tin roof over wood porch character defining feature? <laughs> Great. Oh, oh, I love these questions, you know, because now we've got these layers, layers of history. Right. Uh, and, and there's no quick answer to that. If, if that metal roof has been there for a long time, you know, okay. Uh, it, it's, uh, um, one could make the case for keeping the metal roof on it or replacing in kind, I would say, uh, if I could put on the hat of a design review uh, a person. If there's evidence of what was there earlier, there's another option. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's latitude each way. Okay. And here's a question. I think that's it. Oh, I don't even remember what you asked me. Um, 
I think that's it for questions. Again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I do have a question, Tom. I have two historic photos of our porch. One is an earlier photo. The porch had square columns with these very fancy brackets. And the second one, which is in the early 1900s, all of a sudden they switched to round tapered Doric columns. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that was a very common style in that period. But was it common? I mean, porches change, evolve. But was it common for people to intentionally switch the styles, even if the porch wasn't deteriorated? Yeah, great question there, Beverly, because I really think what we tend to, tend to see, um, especially as the 20th century started to uh, uh, move along, was that a lot of these projects were based on the availability of pre-manufactured parts, often ordered through catalogs or, or uh, 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 sort of available in the marketplace. So we, we tend to see it's not at all uncommon for there maybe to be a second or third generation porch that was put on with those products were, that were available at the time, rather than being, shall we say, specifically architecturally designed this way or that way. It was more about availability. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, uh, if you have earlier evidence, photographs and so on, if there's a desire to do a restoration, based on that, that, that evidence, there's one option. Uh, but again, I guess this is my point that I tried to make in the beginning. It's almost of the nature of porches for them to have gone through changes at a, at a, at a faster pace, if you will, typically than, than many other parts of, of, of buildings. So that may ultimately serve as something that tells us about their history and use and so on. But was it considered also like a modernization, like the exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, particularly kind of getting rid of the of the Victorian memories, if if you will, yeah. the moving huh. to the colonial revival style was very very common. Uh, so we're going to tear off that shallow bracketed porch, and we're going to put on this new tapered column colonial revival and paint it white, get rid of the brown, <laughs> you know, it's yep. all, all tied up with this new generation, new attitude and so on. So let me just, I see we're out of time, but let, let me let me just thank everybody for coming. And it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces and names here. I look forward to continuing these conversations. Please send me an email and let's let's have those, those, those chats, especially for so, so many former students. And I will be sending out a follow up email tomorrow with all kinds of links and this information sort of summarized. So if you didn't get it, you'll get it tomorrow. Okay. So thank you so much, Tom, and for everybody for joining today. And hopefully, even though it's snowing today, this weekend you can get out and enjoy your porches. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.